Welcome everyone to this webinar organized by PSUTU, the Finnish Association for Psychedelic Research. Our topic today is psychedelic psychiatry. What can we learn from the past? And our speaker today is Erika Wick, who is a professor of history and the Canada Research Chair in the History of Medicine at the University of Saskatchewan. So please welcome Erika. I will give, give her now the opportunity to give her presentation. Thanks so much. Uh, thanks so much everyone for, for joining us as well. I'm going to attempt to share my screen if it will allow me to. Um, is that working? Uh, hopefully somebody will shout out if not. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm really pleased to be here. I'm really grateful for the opportunity to speak with you today and, um, and share some of this research. I, I've been working on the history of psychedelics for all, almost 25 years now, um, such that when I first started doing this kind of research, uh, my, my PhD committee kind of teased me, made fun of me for studying such an esoteric topic or something that they felt had no relevance. And of course, today that that seems almost silly to imagine as we start talking about psychedelics and we see them kind of mainstreaming in a variety of ways. And I'm I'm always struck by the way that history has still a lot to teach us about what's going on in, in the psychedelic future, um, but also perhaps some of the missed opportunities to reconnect with some of that past as we think about some of the challenges on the horizon. So I'm going to use this opportunity to talk a little bit about the history, but also how it is shaping, I think, some of the contemporary conversations. All right. So I'm going to start, um, you know, put on my historian hat here and think about the origin stories or how we start at the beginning of psychedelics. We know that the word itself, psychedelic, was first uttered in 1956. It was coined in 1957. And I'll talk about that in a little in a few slides here. But of course, the concept of psychedelics or this idea of non-altered states of consciousness or non-ordinary states, sorry, altered states of consciousness or non-ordinary states of consciousness stretches back millennia. When we see, uh, there's there are a variety of different origin stories here. And here are just a few examples of images that I think are evocative of a, a place where we might start, whether it's thinking about psychedelics in a laboratory um, the picture on the top left is, of course, Albert Hoffman in his laboratory at Sandoz, or pictures in the middle and at the bottom about Indigenous ceremonies. The one in the middle is Richard Schultes, the so-called father of ethnobotany in his uh, voyages in the Amazon, where he discovered a variety of hallucinogenic plants and started thinking about the relationship between plants and culture that gave rise to a psychedelic ethos or a way of thinking, a way of being that wasn't necessarily isolated to the plants themselves, but that was a partnership between plants and ceremony. Archaeologists, particularly in Latin America and Central and Latin America, have identified mushroom statues. The ones that you see here pictured on the top right of the screen come from Guatemala, and they suggest that Mushrooms have been honored as plant teachers for millennia, stretching back prior to contact from uh, Europeans. And so these kinds of stories and these remnants throughout history remind us that there's a longer history of psychedelics that stretches far back beyond the 20th century. And which places we choose to start that story, I think, shapes some of our reception of those, you know, whether psychedelics are something that is, you know, moves within a sort of clinical or even Western context, or one that is in partnership between Western and Indigenous uses, or something perhaps even slightly different that might get us to think differently about spirituality and our place in nature. And I'll just use those as the starting point and get into some of these other pictures in a moment. As part of a research project I started about four years ago with a number of colleagues, we tried to do what well, we are trying, we are, I hope, accomplishing this, we're looking at a global history of psychedelics. And as part of that project, we've been trying to map out where different psychedelics have featured in scientific literature. And this is all stuff that we can find online. So things through PubMed or through um, the web of science. And it shows a certain different distribution. You can see different origin stories here and different ways that psychedelic plants or substances have moved around the world. Now, there are a couple of things about these maps that I think are really exciting. I mean, the spaghetti uh, lines on the map are pretty interesting in themselves. And you can sort of track this movement. But there are also certain gaps. 
And some things that you might readily recognize are missing or things that we think of as part of the story of psychedelics that are missing from these maps. So here's one on peyote, psilocybin, mushrooms, and ayahuasca. Um, so sort of naturally derived psychedelics. And here's another one for some synthetics. So LSD, ketamine, and MDMA are the ones we chose here. What I want to emphasize with these maps is that it was a really fun project to put together as we tried to like create this huge database of information where psychedelics have moved from and where different labs sort of claimed a priority or different labs or research units. But what we also began to recognize is that there are a number of places that are missed on here that we feel should be part of the story. And so I think in some respects, this is a demonstration of some of the limits of our access to information about the history of psychedelics. And I'm going to use that word. Um, even though it wasn't coined until the 20th century, but to capture this concept of psychedelics. There are a number of stories that don't resonate in what's available currently on the internet, at least through different scientific publications. And it distorts perhaps our understanding then of the fuller, of a fuller picture of psychedelics. Um, so cool maps, but limited. <laughs> When we look at different kinds of evidence, whether that's archaeological evidence um, or different, how shall I put this, different kinds of texts that don't necessarily talk about psychedelics, but that talk about the effects of psychedelics or talk about uh, spiritual quests or even different kind of non-Western forms of medicine, we begin to see different pictures that we might think are sort of widening this frame of what should be included in the history of psychedelics. And so here I'll start on the top left. One of the things, um, so I'm trying to find these different images to, to help give different examples. So of course, this is not comprehensive. We know, for example, that as far back as ancient Egypt, there are replicas and friezes or these um, statues and carvings that suggest that, that mushrooms, and here Paul Stamets, one of our you know, resident mushroom uh, aficionados, suggests that these are perhaps psilocybin mushrooms that seem to be part of a ceremony. And archaeologists and Egyptologists have started to explore this, these kinds of um, depictions, a carving, I guess, um, and suggest that these kinds of ceremonies are suggestive of something that would be um, honoring pharaohs, that the mushrooms may have been used in this instance as a way of cultivating some kind of insight. They would have been used in a very elite sense. And part of that is now um, corresponds with other forms of mushrooms that are found in ancient Egyptian carvings and jewelry, um, earrings, different kinds of jewelry that depict these and suggest that there's a kind of symbolic um, special status associated with these mushrooms. So as you can tell, like, obviously, this is not something that I study closely. Um, but also, this is something that is still being discovered, we're still finding these remnants, we I mean, other people are finding these remnants and re and sort of revising our understanding of the place of mushrooms in this ancient world. On the top part of the screen, who is cannabis? This is an article that was produced by Shakruna Institute for Psychedelic Plants. But the story itself is about looking through Chinese herbalism to recognize the way that different plants were used, not strictly for medicinal purposes, but also to conjure different kinds of insights. So hallucinogenic plants, including cannabis, where the seeds were smoked in this case, um, to produce different kinds of insights that were associated with a sort of spiritual healing, if you will. One of the things that I've learned from some of my ethnobotanist friends is that by looking at plants first, um, instead of looking for psychedelics, we begin to see how a variety of different plants and even combinations of plants have contributed to our understanding of this quest for something that we might now associate with a feeling of, psych of being psychedelic. In the bottom left, this is a rather famous or infamous image that's uh, reproduced in, an, um, in a book called The Wondrous Mushroom, which was one of the first catalogs written in English, at least, um, of the mushrooms of the Mazatec, Sierra Mazatec indigenous people in Mexico. In this image, a historian suggests that this is the god of the underworld who is sort of, you know, the kind of um, the figure here with talons on his feet and his or her. Um, who is sort of coming into the consciousness or coming into the mind of the mushroom eater, the seated figure who seems to be eating mushrooms and the mushroom is seated, seated there in this particular drawing. And in these codices, one of the things that uh, Mexican scholars, archaeologists, linguists, and historians are finding 
is that there's a blending of different ideas here from Aztec to Mayan, Miztec, and some pre-contact re representations of mushrooms, which again suggests that this idea about seeking out mushrooms for what we might think of as psychedelic purposes stretches back quite a long time prior to contact, millennia perhaps. And the final picture here on the bottom right is a, a, a sort of cut in version of Heronius Hieronymus Bosch's, sorry for my mispronunciation, um, of his this Dutch painter who depicted the poisoning of ergot, ergot poisoning, or St. Anthony's fire, as it was dubbed in the Middle Ages. And so there are also these kind of spectacles of despair and disorder, even chaos, that come from what we now know came from ergot poisoning, which, of course, was the fungus that inspired LSD. All of this to say that I think there are many, many different kinds of stories that compete for our attention when we consider the sort of widest frame possible for incorporating these different origin stories for psychedelics. So stories of intoxication, as we might think of on the bottom left, stories of honor, honoring and ceremony, but also ways that psychedelics have been embedded in different kinds of healing mechanisms. So I'm going to push us to, to think a little bit about some of the modern origin stories. And of course, Albert Hoffman is key, key to that. So I'm sure you're all familiar, but I can't see any of your faces. So I'm going to keep talking unless someone interrupts me and just go on and, and tell this particular story, which I think has become a sort of traditional narrative within this field, particularly as we think about the role of psychedelics in modern clinical medicine or Western medicine, if you will. So in 1938, Albert Hoffman, working at Sandoz Pharmaceuticals, as the story goes, synthesized D-lysergic acid diethylamide 25, what later became known as lysergic acid or LSD. And he did this in part because his boss at the time, Arthur Stuhl, who was the director of research at Sandoz Pharmaceutical Company in Switzerland, suggested that there was something about ergot that demanded a kind of pharmaceutical attention. Even those images from the Middle Ages of ergot poisoning, um, you know, as, as historians and scholars sort of unpack some of those images and some of those stories, it's clear that ergot was being used by midwives as purposely, unlike the people who ate the infected bread by accident, midwives were using these to control blood flow, to bring about contractions, and to change the way that women experienced childbirth. And as soon as we get into this topic, of course, it becomes very murky. So the records are really tricky to track down because, of course, midwives at some points not only hastened contractions to bring about a birth, but also hastened contractions to bring about abortions or a miscarriage, if you will. So some of this information has been coded and kept secret or, uh, you know, women were avoiding persecution by not talking about this kinds of applications of ergot. But Sandos was a bit wise to this, and they found different evidence that midwives had been using ergot for some time and felt that there may be a commercial opportunity for developing an obstetrical medication that might aid in this kind of pharmaceutical um, birthing process. And so that initially, Albert Hoffman set off to look into this sort of gynecological medication. But of course, that's not where this story goes. A few years later, on April 19th, 1943, Albert Hoffman and had the first intentional LSD experience, which of course has been memorialized as Bicycle Day. Here he is, you know, looking very chemistry-like. Um, and there are a number of different depictions of Bicycle Day. I know there are a, a handful, perhaps, of graphic novels depicting this story. There are um, some blotter acid uh, also commemorating Bicycle Day. And as the story goes, on April 16th, he had his first LSD experience. This one was unintentional when some LSD, uh, d lysergic acid diethylamide, spilled out of a vial and caused him to hallucinate and have this feeling of synesthesia, the sort of mixing up of, of feelings and um, senses, such that he was quite disoriented and felt that he had actually poisoned himself. His lab assistant, uh, Susie Ramstein helped him that day. She brought him milk, which is a pretty, pretty common thing in a chemistry lab to sort of neutralize some of the effects. But as the effects wore off, he decided that he would return to this experience a few days later, April 19th, when he took the first intentional um, LSD trip. He got onto his bicycle that day. And as his lab notes reveal, he felt that he'd been plunged into a Salvador Dali painting. 
Um, he could feel his legs moving, but the street was yawning and rippling ahead of him. And he was sort of discoordinated or uncoordinated rather. Reality and perception were clashing with one another. And he felt that he could taste color, that he could see sound. And this sort of mixing of senses caused confusion and dis disorientation, but also tremendous introspection. As a chemist, he was not in a position to apply this experience in a, in a clinical way, um, but he went back to Arthur Stahl and his uh, research directors at Sandoz Pharmaceuticals and suggested that this substance was worth further investigation. And that's what happened. Now, I've been running a series for the last couple of years on women in psychedelics, and I would be remiss if I did not acknowledge the role played by his lab assistant, Susie Ramstein, who's in some ways been lost to history. Uh, she left the lab when she was married, as was the custom, and uh, she also changed her name, so she's more difficult for us to track down now. She was the first woman to take LSD, which she did in June of 1943. Uh, she wisely took public transit that day instead of taking uh, her bicycle. Um, and we don't have lab notes the same way we do for Albert Hoffman. So we don't know very much about her experience other than that she was critical in capturing uh, Albert Hoffman's experience. She was the one who kept the notes. She's the one who sort of helped to uh, follow him along, explain to his wife what was going on. And you'll see her depicted in some of the graphic novels on this bicycle trip as well. Um, so a shout out to Susie. Now Hoffman's discovery was fascinating in and of itself and ushered in a variety of different ways of thinking about altered states of consciousness. But to set the context here, it also fell at a very sort of precipitous time within the history of psychiatry and psychopharmacology. Um, people like Stan Groff, who himself went on to become a psychedelic sort of heavyweight within this field, suggests that Dr. Hoffman's discovery of LSD generated a powerful wave of interest in brain chemistry, and together with the development of tranquilizers, was directly responsible for what has been called the golden age of psychopharmacology. We know from psychopharmacologists and historians working in this field that in the 1950s, there were more psychopharmaceutical products that entered the market than ever before in human history, and some suggest ever uh, more than ever since in terms of those origin stories and patents. We know that this is the dawning of a sort of ramping up of direct-to-consumer advertising, direct-to-physician advertising. And in another project that I'm working on with a, a colleague, we're looking at the kind of global advertising of pharmaceuticals. And what we're finding is that it doesn't really matter even which jurisdiction you look at. There's a flooding of the mar into the marketplace of psychopharmaceuticals in this period in the 1950s. And we really see this uh, the attention focused on antidepressants, anti-anxiety medications, um, and a whole variety of pills that are aimed at providing solutions within psychiatric disorders. And there's a longer history here that I won't go into great detail on, but just to simply say that this period also coincides with the introduction of the first diagnostics and statistics manual produced and published by the American Psychiatric Association, which has since sort of become one of the standard classification systems for psychiatric disorders. And I don't think it's any coincidence, and I'm certainly not the only one to claim this, that the introduction of the DSM alongside chlorpromazine, the first tranquilizer, the first antipsychotic medication, um, these happened actually in the same year, even though it wasn't available in the United States for another couple of years. My point is that during the 1950s, both the classification of disorders and the introduction of psychopharmacology meant that there was a forged connection between these two things. There's a lot of money flowing into research at this time for pharmaceutical um, development, uh, psychopharmacological development in particular, and the consequences are quite dramatic. The idea that people can survive outside of an institutional context if they take daily dose pharmaceuticals is quite revolutionary at this time. And I'll get into that a little bit more in a moment. So LSD in some respects is unremarkable as it it, it sort of enters into this research climate at a moment when lots and lots of research is taking place around pharmaceuticals and psychopharmaceuticals in particular. So sort of brain sciences uh, is the infancy of neurosciences still at this time. But uh, this idea that we can change behavior through chemicals is really potent in this moment. 
And so there's some funding available. And one of the places that attracts a significant research unit for psychedelics is in the province that I live and work in is Saskatchewan. So in this prairie province of Canada, sort of, um, I don't know how to describe it best to you, not quite the geographical middle, it's slightly left of the middle, um, it's completely landlocked. Uh, we've had a population of about a million people since about 1905. And although people come and go, the population sort of hovers at the same numbers. It's not considered typically a fairly dynamic place. It's, you know, long, cold winters. We're not quite as north as you all, but uh, we get a lot of darkness. And right now we have a lot of light, but it doesn't tend to attract a lot of inspiration. And we don't tend to think of this place as an innovation, innovative place. But in 1944, this Canadian province elected the first socialist government in North America. And this changed the story or the reputation of that particular province. And you can see the flag there with CCF. CCF stands for the Cooperative Commonwealth Federation, which is the precursor to the party today, which is called the New Democratic Party. As the first sort of uh, self-avowed party uh, devoted to socialism, the premier at the time, who's pictured on the bottom, uh, the bottom right of the first panel there, his name is Tommy Douglas, and he campaigned on a program to introduce publicly funded health care. As part of that campaign, he took over the role of health minister and started aggressively recruiting people into the province to participate in projects, in research, as well as an administrative product, projects rather, um, that would support this publicly funded health care vision. And one of the people he recruited was a British psychiatrist named Humphrey Osmond. Osmond, whose head is growing flowers and ideas in the second panel, um, in this depiction at least, um, Humphrey Osmond was trained in the UK. He was trained in psychoanalytic methods as well as in psychiatry and was curious about the psychopharmacology that was unfolding before his eyes. But he was really, really fascinated by psychosis and hallucinations and delusions the way that patients with psychosis described their challenges, described their realities even. In fact, he was one of the founders of Schizophrenics Anonymous, which created a patient sort of peer group for discussing psychosis. So Osmond came to Saskatchewan. Um, he was recruited by Tommy Douglas to become the superintendent of what is described as the largest mental hospital in Canada. Some people have argued that it's the largest in the British Commonwealth. I'm skeptical of that. Uh, suffice to say, it's large. And it was hugely overcrowded. There were room for 2,000 beds, and there were over 4,000 patients registered at a given time when Osmond took over. So he's dealing with this sort of Herculean task of reforming this outdated, outmoded psychiatric hospital. And he's dealing with about 70% of the patients that he was dealing with were those with psychosis, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder. And some of the categories kind of are a bit fluid, but needless to say, um, he was dealing with a number of patients who many people felt were hopeless cases. And Osmond immediately began, was attracted to these uh, substances that produced hallucinations because he thought this might help to provide some insight into understanding the organic psychosis. So if you could model schizophrenia, if you could model psychosis, perhaps you could study it differently. And with a fairly uh, flexible uh, research environment, with the support of the government, uh, Osmond was able to set up a research unit that was in some respects unparalleled elsewhere. In fact, he felt that he had enough research flexibility that this helped to uh, keep him in Saskatchewan rather than returning to the, um, to the United Kingdom, uh, Surrey, which is where he was studying before. So this image comes from 1953. And this is when an English magazine came out to Saskatchewan. The fellow in the red shirt is a reporter named Sidney Katz. And he's, of course, ringed by these uh, white-coated physicians, uh, one's a social worker, a psychologist, and two psychiatrists here. Humphrey Osmond, I don't know if you can tell, but he's holding a little red thing. It's actually a camera. He was taking photographs at the time. There's what looks like a record player on the table. Uh, this is actually uh, a recorder. They were recording the session rather than playing music in this particular session. And the carpet is real. I think that was in the in the hospital. Um, so in the middle, Sydney Katz is drinking a glass that's got LSD in it. Prior, So leading up to this moment in 1953, which is fairly early in some respects, Osmond had been uh, playing with this idea of the model psychosis. To this extent, he did not initially 
give mescaline or LSD to patients, but he was giving them to himself um, and to other staff, psychiatrists, social workers, et cetera, um, psychiatric nurses, so that people had a better appreciation for what psychosis was like. The idea that your sense of reality could be tampered with or disordered to such a degree that you could no longer communicate it to someone, that it was difficult to find that level of communication. People didn't believe you and may respond to you in different ways. It rendered people powerless at times. They wanted to use this as a way of inspiring a kind of empathy within the hospital. And what Sidney Katz experienced on that day in October um, in 1953 was much like what we see with some of the standard descriptions, including Albert Hoffman's, this sense of disorienting his senses, of mixing them up. You see that carpet, at least um, in this graphic novel depiction. This is a more modern depiction, um, but it is, it's also evident in the, in the images that we see from 1953 and in the text that accompanies it. Sidney Katz feels time distorted. You know, the carpet comes alive, the visual cues in the room start to swim and float. Um, so in some respects, if you're familiar with psychedelics, which I'm sure you all are, these are fairly sort of typical responses. But again, um, this was something that was considered rather novel at the time. So they recorded all of this quite carefully. And here are a few excerpts. I won't, I won't, I'll just read the first one. So this is a 12 page um, spread that is in one of the major Canadian magazines at the time. Sydney Cass says, I'll never be able to fully describe, sorry, describe fully what happened to me during my excursion into madness. There are no words in the English language designed to convey the sensations I felt or the visions, illusions, hallucinations, colors, patterns, and dimensions, which my disordered mind revealed. And this notion sort of sticks with Osmond, this idea that it's very difficult to convey those sensations, that there's no concept or language um, that really accurately uh, sort of collapses that into a concept. And this is where our friend Aldous Huxley comes into the story. Huxley had heard about some of the experiments that were taking place in Saskatchewan. I should have mentioned Osmond shows up in Saskatchewan in 1951. So at this point, it's a couple of years of experiments. And he started to gather a research team around him. So Huxley wrote him a letter and invited him to share some of his research with him. And what happened next becomes kind of another origin story, if you will. Humphrey Osmond decided to drive to Los Angeles where Aldous Huxley was living, another um, British expat in this case, and he took mescaline with him. And it's through their correspondence that we come up with the word psychedelic. So here you're seeing like a scan of the actual original document uh, where the word psychedelic is first coined. And uh, I don't expect anyone to, to read all of this. It's just, you know, my desire to have sort of historical authenticity here. On the left-hand side, you see a typewritten letter from, hum, uh, sorry, from Aldous Huxley, which was typed by his wife, Maria. And in the bottom, in the blue handwriting, you can see him kind of playing with different concepts. They've, they've decided that they need a concept to sort of describe this experience that one has when they take masculine or LSD. Later, they'll add psilocybin to this list. So he says, to make this trivial world sublime, take half a gram of phenarothyme. Those are the Huxley words. And in the just beneath that in red, you can see Humphrey Osmond writing, to plumb the depths of sore angelic, just take a pinch of psychedelic. And he changes this. And if you Google it, you'll see a variety of different sort of rhyming couplets that they use. And many of them are ones that Osmond actually came up with. Um, he tried it out a few different ways. You can see an example on the, on the right-hand side of the screen as well. This friendship that formed between these two men, one, a writer, usually considered a dystopian writer, and this psychiatrist is something that's quite beautiful in some respects, but I think is another important piece of the psychedelic story or the psychedelic history. And this idea that you needed to have a kind of literary mind, or you needed an inquisitive philosophical mind, together with the psychiatric side of it, or the, or the clinical side, in order to really sort of invest a, a variety of different kinds of ideas um, into this concept of psychedelic. You can read about that more if you want in the correspondence, which is the psychedelic prophets on the bottom there. One of the other themes, though, that developed in Osman's work, and he was quite an expansive thinker. He was very curious about a variety of ways that people had come to understand these kinds of experiences or to give meaning to them. And so he started reaching out to anthropologists who had already been studying the Native American church. That is uh, an indigenous organization that is uh, legally recognized in a number of American states um, and later in Canada. And 
one that had used peyote as what they described as a sacrament. So this is a kind of syncretic religion that brings in different Christian elements as well as indigenous uh, elements of spirituality, uh, sort of centering around the peyote cactus, which grows mostly in southern Texas and northern Mexico in a place called the Peyote Gardens that kind of hugs the Rio Grande River, which is uh, also the dividing line between Mexico and Texas. So Osman started reaching out to anthropologists and also found that there was a Native American church branch or chapter in his own province of Saskatchewan. In fact, the only legally registered one in Canada, and perhaps there's a coincidence here. The reason he came across it was because um, RCMP officers or the the, um, national police force in Canada had been, uh, my words, I'll use my words here, harassing um, Indigenous users of peyote. Now, again, Peyote grows in southern Texas and northern Mexico, and as if you can well imagine, that climate is not reproduced in parts of Saskatchewan where these ceremonies were taking place. And there's sort of troubled police officers and federal agents who were concerned that this was an importation of a particular substance, but also an importation of perhaps a radical sense of spirituality or a radical Indigenous group. And so uh, anyway, I'll, I'll get into this in a moment. So in the bottom side, you see the response from the national, the federal bureaucrat here who says, we're anxious to control the use of this substance among Indians. I do not believe that if any thinking man had direct knowledge of the disgusting orgies that occur when these peyote sprees uh, are indulged in by groups of Indians, he would hesitate to take drastic steps to curb its use or curtail its use rather. So there's already a clear clash between the federal authorities um, who cling to a kind of prohibitionist stance and both researchers and Indigenous users of a peyote cactus. And rather than sort of, you know, you see this this man with a British accent in a tweed coat, he doesn't really perform the way we might expect. Historically, he doesn't cling to the federal perspective. Instead, of course, as we know, he's quite empathetic to the plight of the Indigenous people in this part of the world. So in 1956, he was invited to participate in a peyote ceremony that was hosted by the Red Pheasant Band, which is in uh, Saskatchewan. And it's a fairly staged event. I think everyone was certainly on their best behavior. Everyone's dressed quite finely, but they'd invited reporters and photographers to capture this ceremony. And this is these are a few of the examples, and there are a couple of, I'll talk about a couple of the leaders here. They also invited leaders of the national chapters of the Native American church that is uh, leaders who were in North Dakota and Montana, so northern states that are relatively close to Saskatchewan, who came and performed the ceremony and spoke eloquently about the importance of these ceremonies for dealing with the sort of heavy wheels of colonialism. And that's some of the language that's used in the transcripts that were reproduced later. So this really quite clear depiction of, you know, the Native American church being a response to colonialism, one that uses peyote as a sacrament. You can see Osmond sort of eager to get the tobacco uh, that is being passed around in this moment uh, in the sort of larger picture. So participating in these ceremonies gave Osmond different ideas about how you might incorporate different ideas about psychedelics into a clinical practice. He took different cues and some of which he recorded quite clearly and attributed quite clearly and others are a bit more subtle. So things like Um, preparing for the experience. In the tent, what he describes as my night in the teepee, um, he says, you know, there was quite, there was a lot of intention. There was fasting, there was drumming. And even when he said he didn't understand the language that was spoken in that setting, you could tell that there was a clear set of intentions. Things were laid out in a ritualistic way. And perhaps some of those features could be incorporated into a clinical setting, he said, albeit you'd need to sort of frame them up differently. But he felt that this was really important for thinking about how to effectively and meaningfully bring psychedelics into a clinical space. This is a picture of him with um, Sidney Katz, that reporter, partly because we have photos that we can show. And you can see here, he's sort of encouraging him to stare into the folds of a towel that are over his face to really sort of draw out those hallucinogens, hallucinogenic moments rather play into the hallucinations that he's feeling. You can also see them holding hands. This is, he's still in a white coat, still very sort of a clinical uh, engagement, Um, but it looks different from what we might imagine is going on down the hall where a pharmacist is providing a prescription. Um, There's not this kind of interaction. They start 
started developing protocols and guidebooks. Um, again, beginning in the 1950s, this one comes from a 1959 publication. It's kind of a pamphlet that circulated and ends up going to a variety of different places, including in the United States. And I think in some uh, European examples as well, at least there's tell of that. I haven't actually found the records, but some of these are drawn and he, Osmond acknowledges it later. Some of these suggestions are drawn from those experiences that he had with the peyote ceremonies as well. So thinking about the acoustics of the room, drawing a layout that looks a bit more circular. Um, in fact, they bring in an architect later to help design circular rooms specifically for that purpose. Thinking about music, or at least the acoustics of the space, in addition to the other kinds of environmental features, something that had not traditionally been part of that clinical environment before. And they started bringing music therapists in. Now, despite the fact that the sort of, um, we would consider the, the musical playlist at the Native American church ceremony was drumming and singing. Um, but in this case, they start bringing in classical music. These are a couple of different recent uh, publications that describe the, the place of the set and setting. So this is before the coining of the phrasing set and setting, but the idea that you had to really think about the environment. And again, I, I want to emphasize this because if you imagine the context of the psychopharmacological research, this is moving in the opposite direction from the way that trials are being developed in order to determine the efficacy of other psychopharmaceuticals. So having music therapists, especially female music therapists, I'll get into that in a moment, um, is something that other researchers are going to argue confounds our ability to understand the psychopharmacological effects. And yet for psychedelic researchers, they recognize that to optimize the experience, one needed to think about music, art, uh, lighting, um, all sorts of different features. You needed a couch, you needed people to move freely, you needed access to a private washroom. These sorts of things were really critical for optimizing the psychedelic experience. And as they started moving into patient trials, they found another feature kept cropping up. And here I just give one example. This is a nurse's report of a patient who was being treated for alcoholism. And she says he had a momentary oneness with God. He had a vision while lying down with eyes closed of a spiral staircase with himself talking to another person. This appeared to have great meaning to him. He seems to have gained some insight and understanding of himself. Now, it might not be so surprising that um, people had these kinds of spiritual reactions. And certainly that is that aligns with some of the work that was being done in the indigenous ceremonies as well, or some of the experiences rather. But this didn't have a clear place in clinical medicine. Bringing that spiritual component into a checklist of symptoms and signs or disorders didn't fit very naturally. And yet they kept finding that people wanted to talk about these kinds of spiritual encounters. When they opened this up um, and started publishing the results, first in Saskatchewan, uh, but also in places in Baltimore, at Spring Grove Hospital in Maryland, um, in the LA Veterans Hospital near Stanford, uh, sorry, one in LA, another one in Stanford, um, a number of research units that started focusing on addictions found unprecedented cures. Here's just one um, newspaper article suggesting, you know, that the Saskatchewan Research Unit claimed 70% cures. And these were with those optimized spaces. Now, this kind of these kinds of claims got to the attention of Alcoholics Anonymous co-founder Bill W. or Bill Wilson. Wilson was curious about this, although his organization, which was the leading organization claiming so, some space over, uh, sorry, claiming the best effects with alcoholics, they clung to a, a, a mantra of abstinence. So very clear, you know, no alcohol, no altered substances. But what Wilson Wilson was quite curious about what was happening within these research units where people were taking sometimes, often, a single dose of psychedelics to curb their addiction, in this case, again, alcoholism. And I should also mention, these are mostly men who are going through the program. And Bill W. was quite curious also about this kind of spiritual effect that uh, researchers were claiming. So quietly and sort of in an underground sense, um, he came to Weyburn where Humphrey Osmond was working in Canada and he had his own LSD experience. And he confirmed that this experience was to him like that kind of insight that he reached in hitting rock bottom. It was the kind of insight that would help him, he thought, and help others seek help 
it was in part kind of related to this step two, this idea of seeing outside of yourself, or as the wording in the Alcoholics Anonymous 1952 claims, uh, for our group purposes, there is but one ultimate authority, a loving God who may express himself in our group conscience. This kind of spiritual dimension Bill W. felt was lacking in the clinical encounters, that no, no amount of clinical intervention could help alcoholics get the kind of help that they needed or reach the kind of place that they needed to psychologically in order to retain help or sustain that kind of desire for help. But with a single, albeit sometimes massive, dose of LSD or mescaline or combination of the two or later psilocybin, he felt that Alcoholics Anonymous patrons might actually sort of kickstart that process and help people get started with the 12-step program more effectively. And that seemed to be working. In some places in Saskatchewan, if I had a map here, I would show basically adjacent provinces, Manitoba, Alberta, in the Canadian case, and Montana and North Dakota, so south of us, a number of Alcoholics Anonymous chapters started vouching for the use of psychedelics as a way into a psychedelic experience, or sorry, a, a treatment module. Tommy Douglas, who I mentioned earlier, the premier of Saskatchewan, was quite excited about this. The idea that you could get alcoholics, again, mostly men, off of the alcohol, back into working condition, men who would ultimately pay taxes, perhaps pay child support, who might resume their relationships with wives or children, this was a good thing. And it was fairly cost effective. A single dose, even with support staff for a 12-hour session, was still ultimately a lot cheaper for a publicly funded healthcare system than one that required long stay institutionalization. Alcoholics Anonymous quietly supported it, and you can see this reflected in their newsletters where they suggest that if people are having trouble starting the 12 steps, that they could reach out to, and there was a list of sympathetic psychiatrists who were willing to provide psychedelic therapies for free, as funded by the Saskatchewan government in this case, um, but also as part of a sort of legal uh, psychiatric intervention. And I won't go into great detail about the other images here, um, but suffice to say, even some of the clergy who felt that it was sort of within their domain to treat alcoholics um, began to get curious about psychedelics as they felt that this spiritual dimension, this realignment with God uh, of a variety of different denominations was something that they might get behind. And a couple of clergy members actually got together and had their own LSD experience. And some of them sort of took that on for the rest of their lives as a, a marrying of these two principles, that psychedelics and religion. Things seemed to be going quite well for a while. In the 1950s, psychedelics were getting a very strong reputation. The clinical reports suggested that they were producing what we might today call breakthrough therapies, even though that language wasn't used. But things began to come to a, an abrupt halt in the 1960s. And although it's tempting to blame American hippies, and I will a little bit, um, I think there are also some scientific reasons that um, kind of got in the way or tripped up the psychedelic momentum. And one of those was the introduction of thalidomide in 1961. It was banned in West Germany in 1961 and in Canada in 1962. The, the sort of photographic representation of these children born with teratogenic birth defects or children born with shortened limbs and the many, many, many miscarriages that occurred uh, from women who took thalidomide um, really, I think, caused some panic uh, amongst the public. As I, as I mentioned at the beginning, if you imagine the 1950s are kind of a, a revolutionary moment in terms of introducing psychopharmaceuticals and pharmaceuticals more broadly, um, the idea that these chemicals that are sold as safe or prescribed as safe were causing these kinds of horrific deformities um, or deformities considered to be horrific, this really shook the public confidence in, in science, but also in the capacity to determine the risks associated with consuming these pharmaceuticals. There were a number of inquiries that took place across Europe. I should mention that um, thalidomide was never marketed for sale in the United States. So this story really sort of cleaves out the United States in some respects. But it was in Canada, 111 children were um, born with deformities in Canada, and this occasioned an inquiry much like some of those that took place in Europe. And at that time, Canadian officials, bureaucrats mostly suggested that we needed to have different standards of ethical protocols in place before drugs could be considered safe. Uh, 
and they added LSD to that list of substances that required more investigation before they could be marketed as safe. Now, at that time, the researchers who had been involved with psychedelics, including the Saskatchewan group, but also a variety of others across the country, were quite taken aback by this move. They felt that this was a hasty way to sort of push LSD into an area that was undeserved, that LSD did not deserve this kind of reputation. And they pushed back against this, arguing that these should be scientific decisions, not political decisions. And I won't go into all the um, bits here, but um, essentially a number of organizations, including the sort of national organizations representing psychiatrists and physicians across Canada, came together to defend this move, that this should be a medical decision, not a political decision. And one of the decisions that came forward, uh, sorry, not really a decision in terms of a policy, but the mantra of the randomized controlled trial was also being debated internally within internal to medicine and psychopharmacology at this time. And this becomes part of the conversation. So as I mentioned before, as chlorpromazine and largactyl and a variety of different sort of psychopharmaceuticals are rolling onto the market, they are performing well in clinical trials, including clinical trials that are blinded, clinical trials that are randomized, and the RCT or the randomized controlled trial becomes a mantra for determining efficacy in the early 1960s. Arguably, historians have argued that, you know, people have used different versions of this all the way back to the early modern period, but really it's not until the 20th century, first with streptomycin in 1938, so this anti-TB medication, which is used where, where blinding and placebo are really implemented as a way to evaluate the efficacy. But RCTs are not really embraced until the 1960s. And I think in part in reaction to some of the concerns about the things like thalidomide, but also a variety of other chemicals that were causing un, undesirable effects. Psychedelics did not perform well in RCTs. People like, as you can see in the middle slide, double blind clinical trials, A. Hoffer, with this Abram Hoffer, who's a Saskatoon based researcher here in, in Saskatchewan, and Humphrey Osmond are critical of the introduction of these controlled trial environments, which negate all of those optimizing effects that they had learned the couch, the music, the artwork um, that those elements were sort of cleaved out of the equation, and that these were producing negative event. Uh, uh, sorry, negative responses to psychedelics, or at least under-optimized or sort of, um, they were underachieving in these contexts. The idea that you could produce a psychedelic placebo, which was also required for the RCTs, was something that many psychedelic researchers simply laughed at, said you cannot find in a, a placebo, you can't give someone water, they just get pissed off. Um, in fact, they played around with a variety of different ways to accomplish some kind of placebo effect, and people got frustrated and left the trials, rendering them uh, sort of unpublishable and unremarkable. So while scientists are arguing and debating about how to bring psychedelics into this um, particular kind of scientific methodology, there are other aspects, and here's where I'll begin to blame some of those hippies. Um, one of them, of course, was not initially a hippie but a Harvard psychologist, Dr. Timothy Leary, who in 1963 lost his job at Harvard. Depending on the biographer you read, you get different stories here, but um, he was doing psilocybin research or mushroom research with uh, prisoners, male prisoners, but he was also sleeping with some of his students and not showing up to class. Uh, so there were a variety of reasons why Timothy Leary was, was fired from Harvard. The official letter says it was because he was failing to show up for his lectures. But rather than sort of go away um, quietly, Timothy Leary does exactly the opposite. And he catapults into the public spotlight, into the media spotlight as a guru of psychedelics, a self-appointed guru of psychedelics, who now moves far beyond the clinical context and argues that we need to use psychedelics to advance society, to advance the human civilization. Everybody should have access to this. They shouldn't be patented. They should be in the water supplies even. Arguably, he suggested that Khrushchev and Nixon should take LSD in order to end the Cold War. And of course, Leary's not the only one, but he's a convenient scapegoat in some respects, as we recognize quickly that beginning in the latter half of the 1960s, it's quite evident that psychedelics or things that are being sold as psychedelic, things that are causing these non-altered states, are, you know, 
uh, being consumed by a wide variety of people, including, of course, these, you know, wasted youth, or at least that's how the images go. And this puts those scientists and those researchers in an awkward position. People like Osmond, who's depicted here, trying to sort of, he actually goes to Haight-Ashbury in San Francisco and meets with some of the underground chemists who are creating sort of copycat acid. Apparently, some of it is quite good. Um, it rivaled Sandoz's acid. So people like Owsley Stanley, who was a roadie for the Grateful Dead, um, claims to have made over a million hits of acid. Others um, claim to have created over 5 million hits and distributed acid around the world. And Osmond was quite, quite concerned about this. Not only did he feel that he could no longer do good research when people were coming into his clinic seeking a safe room rather than seeking a kind of naive drug experience, but he also worried about whether or not psychiatrists and science in general was going to be blamed for the way that people were consuming psychedelics in this more reckless fashion. Um, and we know that about by 1962, um, it's clear that blotter acid or acid dabbed on paper was becoming something recognizable. Uh, apparently, according to the guy that uh, has his arm around me there in the bottom image, um, his name is Mark McLeod, and he's the director of the Institute for Psych for sorry for Illegal Art. Um, the institute is his home, and it's filled with blotter acid. He thinks that the first known blotter acid came from New York in 1962, but it really takes off by the end of the 1960s, particularly as acid becomes both a commodity, but also made illegal. It's very difficult for police to detect blotter acid, um, but also it creates this tension between the kind of clinical science with psychedelics and the countercultural uses of psychedelics. And as I mentioned before, and what these uh, panels are trying to depict is how this changed the scientific research that was taking place as different kinds of people were enrolling in trials. Again, those seeking a kind of safe experience or maybe pure Sandoz LSD. They were comparing it with their own street, uh, street examples and trying to gain some experience and knowledge, not necessarily for uh, you know, the wider scientific community, but for their own uses. This creates a lot of tension. By the end of the decade, there are a number of jurisdictions beginning with New York and California that criminalize psychedelics along with a variety of other drugs um, beginning in 1966, but then by the 1970s, jurisdictions around the world sort of sign on to the UN convention, the one in 1971 here, suggesting that psychedelics should be on schedule one, that schedule, which is considered to have no medical, sorry, I mean, try my words again, uh, for substances that are considered to have no medical value, and that are at high risk of causing addiction. We know that those things uh, don't necessarily ring true today, um, but that was the language that was used in 1971 to justify this international effort to clamp down on psychedelic, um, recreational use of psychedelics. There are a few jurisdictions that are allowed to continue doing research, but they kind of shrink down and some of them close down actually because they suggest that their supplies are being raided or that they're getting a bad reputation and that it's difficult to get funding for continued experimentation. So while the kind of clinical side of psychedelics dries up or dies down or gets squeezed out, depending on how you want to interpret this, there's another part of the story that really kind of proliferates or expands in this moment. And it's part of a research project that I'm doing. So these are just a few examples that I, I find kind of fascinating. But we see the pairing of psychedelics with countercultural movements, some of which are radical, some of which I would argue are, are really just more recreational. And really, this becomes a global phenomenon. Um, so the High Times magazine on the bottom right actually is an Australian publication. There are, of course, American publications. The Grateful Dead's music is apparently, you know, both inspired by taking psychedelics as well as better enjoyed while on psychedelics. Blotter acid is moving around the world. We know that Goa, for example, in India um, is the recipient of, you know, pilgrimages to this kinds of um, homage to Eastern religious experiences that are infused with psychedelics, many of which are created by some of these famous underground or amateur uh, chemists, um, some of whom come from California, but quickly begin to proliferate into other parts of the world. And you see this reflected in music and fashion, um, even in the literature at the time, and it really becomes a global phenomenon. It moves outside of specific research units or even specific places like San Francisco, which is still considered, a, I think, a sort of epicenter for some of the psychedelic movement. But we begin to see this 
popping up all over the world. With the intervention of, oh, sorry, with the introduction of desktop publishing, there are also a variety of different underground publications that stimulate the proliferation of psychedelics. And I'll just, these are just a few examples, but mushroom growing guides. Um, I don't think I put one in here, but there are also DMT guides and LSD guides. So different ways that you can chemically create your own psychedelic, um, but also how to identify and grow psychedelic plants. Some of them have a shout out to indigenous uses you might see in the basement shaman here. Um, and others sort of um, really reinforce this kind of plant or organic um, knowledge that exists. These are mostly written under pseudonyms. You often don't find people identifying or claiming credit for them in their own names, um, but they begin to proliferate. Uh, the earliest one that I found is 1976, and that's the one on the bottom right, This uh, the, the one for the Magic Mushroom Growing Guide. And of course, there are some people who are quite open about their clandestine um, support, or sorry, the support for clandestine psychedelic use. And perhaps the most famous of those are Alexander or Sasha Shulgin and his wife, Anne Shulgin, who not only sort of worked with the American federal agency to sort of identify which drugs were being produced, um, but also kind of danced with them in a way. And Alexander Shulgin, a brilliant chemist, uh, would produce and distribute psychedelic drugs faster than the federal authorities could name them or identify them. So he is known for introducing over 200 psychoactive chemicals to the psychedelic underground, including things like 2-Fly, uh, MDMA, which he didn't discover, but he's sort of one of the key chemists in this period for introducing MDMA to the rave culture. In some respects, he might be considered kind of a godfather of rave cultures and certainly an, honor, an honored figure in that scene for the many, many, many psychoactive substances that he tested in that environment. His wife, Anne, was a psychologist. Uh, they both died in the last few years and just last year. Um, and she would try these drugs herself. And then together they would write about both the chemical uh, attributes as well as the um, psychological attributes. And so they became almost cult-like figures in some respects for producing and not patenting, but producing and distributing freely these different substances and the stories that accompanied them. I'm holding a vial of 2CB in that, uh, that's the original vial, which I was pretty excited to get when I saw their lab. And so again, despite the kind of war on drugs and the federal authorities cracking down on and criminalizing psychedelics, there are a number of underground publications that begin to develop their own experiences and their own knowledge about how best to take these, when to take them, kind of a harm reduction approach, if you will. And you see that really sort of picking up with the rave culture. This is a, an example from 1990s um, British rave culture, where there are a variety of different comics and publications suggest sort of giving um, instructions on how best to take your, in this case, MDMA or ecstasy. So I wanted to sort of come to a bit of a conclusion here um, by pulling together these different streams. Here's, I unfortunately do not know who the young man is in the, in the blue shirt there, but on the right, we have Albert Hoffman. So, you know, the guy who sort of synthesized LSD and had the first LSD experience and Timothy Leary, who some suggests is the, the one who let the genie out of the bottle. And so there's a coming together of these different kinds of narratives. So in some respects, the story about psychedelics, the history of psychedelics, some of us, including myself, initially wrote that, you know, it kind of ends in the 1970s when these prohibition narratives come forward, these prohibition policies come forward. But there's this other part of the story where the underground continues. And I think, you know, now in amidst the psychedelic renaissance, we can see some of those stories coming together a little bit. So I've argued that in 2007, although I don't want to like cling to that date specifically, um, we begin to see some changes again. The Lancet publishes an article by David Nutt um, at Imperial College in London, who argues that, you know, we've been wrong about how we identify risks and harms, that psychedelics and others, but psychedelics in particular have been unfairly judged and placed on one end of the spectrum, which has really amounted to creating a lot of difficulties, a lot of bureaucratic red tape in terms of studying psychedelics, but it hasn't done very much to actually help us understand their real meaning or efficacy. What the schedule did, though, is 
make it more difficult to do the science. And this is what the grant application denied suggests there. And of course, Nutt is not alone. A number of researchers, major researchers, major players, and including you know, huge philanthropists have been pouring their energy and investments into cultivating what Ben Sessa uh, has called the psychedelic renaissance. Um, we see this reflected in palliative care. Um, Stephen Ross pictured on the left there is a palliative care physician in New York. Um, and maybe some of you will be attending the conference, the Psychedelic Science in uh, Denver, uh, I think that's next week, um, which is apparently going to be the largest gathering of psychedelic researchers in, the, in, in history. I think it's up to almost 10,000 people now. Um, so sort of bringing together and opening up this conversation about psychedelics as there's a revisiting of this. And I think there are some remnants of this history. So some of it is being pushed by clinical science, you know, whether it's performing in RCTs or challenging the RCT methodology as the perhaps, no, um, perhaps not the best way of measuring efficacy. But we also see this coming through popular media, kind of mainstreaming from a different perspective. And one example is American author Michael Pollan, who's a food critic, who, of course, maybe you've read his book or seen his Netflix docu documentary series, uh, where he takes different psychedelics himself and kind of walks us through, walks readers and viewers through his own experiences and does it in a very articulate and engaging fashion. This book became a bestseller, uh, New York Times bestseller very quickly and has turned on or opened people's eyes to psychedelics who probably weren't reading The Lancet or any other scientific publications. So it's spreading this very quickly. And I'll go through these very quickly. Um, you know, there are just more and more and more conferences that are drawing together, again, different if any of you have been to some of these conferences, you'll know that they have their own feel. Breaking convention is different from ICPR. Um, a bringing together of researchers and in some cases, more celebrities. The Miami event certainly, I think, was billed as that. That's where Mike Tyson spoke. And we're starting to see research centers also challenging this idea that psychedelics um, are something that is recreational or something that kind of clings to that 1970s or 80s or 90s idea. So in the United States, Johns Hopkins was one of the first units to open a dedicated psychedelic research unit. Um, Berkeley followed quickly after in California. In Canada, we have two research units now focused specifically on psychedelics, one in Calgary, which is about six hours from my home here um, by car. That's the closest city to me, by the way. Um, or uh, Queen's University, which is in Ontario and also has a, a psychedelic research unit. So this is merely suggestive of the fact that there are sort of mainstream um, academic sciences now supporting sustained research in these areas. I'll go through this really quickly. Canada was one of the first um, to fully decriminalize marijuana or cannabis, uh, which they did in 2017. And there's a lot of heat now on Canada, you know, in their role, perhaps leadership role in ending the world in psychedelics. I'm not convinced that that's going to happen. I'll spoiler alert if you want to read these 500 words, but I don't think that Canada's ready to do that. I think they're a bit gun shy now. Um, but there is a lot of momentum in the wake of some of the cannabis decriminalization that is taking place in other places as well, of course, that maybe psychedelics are also well suited for this decriminalization momentum. Um, I won't tell you about all the Health Canada stuff because I realize that I've been talking too much and I want to wrap up. Um, suffice to say that uh, Health Canada our federal body that governs this kind of like our FDA um, has, they were making some allowances and now they've shut those down. We do see the United States though, leading the way in some respects by granting breakthrough designation for MDMA and for psilocybin um, in treatment resistant depression and um, uh, sorry, yeah, major depression. And celebrities are coming on strong. Again, huge influencers in social media spaces and changing this narrative once again. So if you are, you know, a sports fan, you can find your favorite athlete, perhaps, who is suggesting that these are life-changing experiences. Uh, Mike Tyson died after taking uh, smoking toad venom from the Buffo uh, toad. Uh, but this, of course, made him good. 
And there are also engineers like Steve Jobs in his autobiography claiming that LSD was one of the most important things that happened to him. This helped him to think about computers in a different way. And of course, we all now here on Zoom, of course, are thankful perhaps um, to those kinds of innovations. So I want to come to a conclusion now with suggest trying to sort of place all of this context or place this story in context rather that there was a recent article in the journal of american medicine um published by the johns hopkins team um suggesting that you know we've been through this kind of wave of infatuation even hype um there's a bit of disillusionment or criticism and that you know psychedelics are on track to reach this section of the graph where he calls the plateau of productivity, sorry, David Yaden calls it the plateau of productivity. Um, and I'm not sure that I agree with this graph, but I thought it was a useful way perhaps to stimulate some conversation about whether or not we're ready to sort of integrate psychedelics, you know, getting over the hype and really thinking about perhaps merging these streams of, I think, a clinical, maybe even a kind of sober appraisal of psychedelics as a potential medicine, but also some of the allure, some of the fun parts of psychedelics that have really animated this history as we see for millennia, but especially in those kind of countercultural moments. So I end with some questions to, to lead us off if you, if you want, although you may have your own questions as well. I think there are some lessons that we can take from this history, questions that were very pertinent at the time, and I don't think were answered then, and I don't think are answered by better technology today. I don't think we have a, a better mastery of psychedelics or some of the larger cultural questions that are at stake. So how could we potentially control psychedelics, um, even just for safety reasons? Um, is there an opportunity to think about reconciling Western and Indigenous approaches to psychedelic practices? And will academic units or research institutions be the place that provides that kind of guiding light for helping us to understand these relationships? Or as David Knight Nutt suggests, are these kind of uh, remnants of a more conservative prohibitionist um, era that make it very difficult to do real research Research. You know, in other words, will the underground surpass the academic research units in terms of accumulating experience and knowledge that is filtered into social media, filtered into the popular press in a way that perhaps academic institutions can't keep up with? So I leave that for us to think about. Thank you very much. Here are some of the references that I was using throughout, and uh, I'm happy to take questions. Thanks. Thank you so much, Erica, for a really engaging talk. And I want to remind all participants that if you have any questions at this time, please write them to the Q&A. And I have actually two questions on my mind, and one of them was also uh, on the Q&A as a really good continuation for my own question. So I would like to like, combine this first question uh, to take both of those into account. So what I had in mind is uh, that what are... Uh, in your estimation, some of the most important lessons we could learn from the past, now that psychedelics are once again re-emerging to our cultural consciousness, and what kind of cultural tensions might be a source of problems now that psychedelics are uh, gaining popularity? And in the chat there was a continuation on this, that especially seeing that conservative political forces are on the rise again, both in Europe and the US, could there be another backlash against psychedelics in the near future, like in the 60s? Or could the hippies ruin it for everyone again? Yeah, we'll have to come up with some updated language for um, today's hippies, I guess. But um, yeah, these are these are questions that keep me up at night, I, I must admit that, you know, I'm more and more convinced that despite whatever political policies come out, whether, you know, uh, and, and I will count Canada in you know, not our prime minister right now necessarily, but certainly there's like a kind of rising tide of what we might think of as more um, conservative elements within our political sphere. And, but I think at the same time, there's a, this is, it's reflective of a growing disconnect between the policies and the practices. So yes, I think there is, you know, a lot of kind of conservatism and desire for prohibiting these substances on a kind of puritanical basis. But I, I mean, I don't know about what it's like in Finland, but even here in my very conservative province that doesn't organically grow mushrooms or peyote, like I have the internet and, you know, I can get, 
Um, you know, and I'm not saying anything that I think is offside here. It's being recorded, right? Um, but you know, there are mushroom dispensaries that are popping up in major cities across Canada and the United States, certainly. Um, you can purchase these things in, in Mexico. You can purchase psilocybin by going to the right places in a quasi legal market. It's a gray market. It's not fully black in the sense that it's fully criminalized. There's a kind of turning a blind eye to the consumption. Now, if I were going to like run a clinical trial on this or something, I think that would be, I'd get into a lot of trouble, but consumption patterns are changing despite the policies. And this is where I think these stories kind of come together a little bit, you know, whether we blame the the so-called hippies or maybe cherish them and say like, they've kind of kept the dream alive a little bit. And there's a lot of, you know, there may be some reckless behavior, but I think there's also a lot of experience and knowledge from the underground that can be harnessed to better sort of think about harm reduction. And, you know, my, my politics might be quite clear here, but, you know, I think that bringing these two streams together actually is a more sustainable psychedelic future than, you know, kind of re reimposing these divisions that even people who don't want to take psychedelics, you know, great. I don't think they're for everybody, but, you know, maybe we should talk about like what happens if kids encounter them or what happens if adults encounter them, you know, what are the best conditions to take them or when should you avoid them? That kind of knowledge, if it's even taboo because things are criminalized, um, isn't going to help us very much. Anybody, it's not going to help either side very much because people are still going to take mushrooms if they want to, uh, to pick on mushrooms and we could throw any other psychedelic in there as well. But I think those are at the moment, at least from my experience, from where I sit, more attainable than some of the other psychedelics. But what is the law in Finland right now? Mm, psychedelics are very illegal, I, I would say. There is not much like a gray area there. And cannabis too? Yeah. But uh, mushrooms grow in Finland, right? Yes, but it is actually like uh, illegal to pick them up in the intention of eating them. So you could do it if you didn't know what they were? Yes. Got it. <laughs> so you see the slipperiness as I'm trying to paint the picture. It's, I mean, I it is kind of, um, it seems silly in some ways, because our access to information is no longer, you know, restricted to going to a library and working with a librarian, you know, we can all get access to this information much more readily. And so it's like, we need to update our ways of communicating about the harms and risks of this, because people are going to take things anyway. Thank you very much for your answer. I think our next question would be quite relevant to this topic. So we'll ask it, but uh, before it, I want to ask Ilka Leva's question, that is it possible to get a PDF of this lecture? And thank you for a very interesting one. Sure. Um, yes, I think, and you've recorded it, but I can, if you want the slides, um, Ilka, uh, I can send them to one of you. <laughs> sure. Then there was Henry's question. Uh, you talked about government-funded psychedelic therapy. Do you know of other countries doing something similar? And what would me learn from uh, of the past lessons of doing that? Yeah, I mean, there are a number of, historically, there are lots of places that had government-funded psychedelic studies. I mean, particularly if we think about, you know, hospital-based research that was done, so not privately funded necessarily. Um, and certainly that continues today. So there's research funding in Israel, for example, both historically and today. Um, throughout a lot of Latin America, there were a number of research units that were engaged in psychedelic research historically that were funded through those kinds of, um, you know, like funded through an academic institution. So I'll, I'll say that's government or publicly funded support. Um, of course, in the Netherlands, psychedelic research continued into the 1980s, but specifically for um, concentration camp syndrome. Uh, in what was Czechoslovakia, continued doing psychedelic research into the 80s as well, and they're under different kinds of jurisdictions, so socialist, communist, and then um, independent later. Uh, you know, there were a number of different sort of government bodies that continued to fund psychedelics. And I, you know, I think it's quite interesting because it does suggest to, to me that at least historically, some of that funding was necessary to retain the momentum of these places, that 
our capacity to raise funds through philanthropy. There wasn't like a GoFundMe page um, in the 1950s to get these research units going. So the places that had sustained government funding became the sort of top players, I think, in many respects. There are a few American examples of privately funded or differently funded, I would say, you know, there's a, a, you know, their healthcare system is so different that it gets confusing here to follow the threads a little bit. Um, but those research units that had sustained public funding, I think, did quite well and produced a lot of the sustainable publications. Um, so it's interesting to see, I think, I mean, I, I assume, and maybe uh, wrongly, that a lot of our academic institutions are under uh, under heat right now to retain that public funding. There's a lot of emphasis on getting private funding from whether that's through patenting or through, you know, investing in different kinds of STEM technologies or STEM sciences rather. But I do think that this is maybe a cry for help for academic institutions to come back into the fold as well. They may not be nimble enough to manage this, but I think that might also be uh, symptomatic of the lack of funding that is pushed into these spaces. Thank you. Uh, I have one of my own questions which I could take at this moment. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned about the historical connection between the development of the DSM categories and uh, innovations on the field of psychopharmacology, like tranquilizers and antidepressants. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you see that the rediscovering of psychedelics and their psychiatric efficacy could make us reinvent our diagnostic models or to somehow reinvent what mental illness is? That's a fascinating question that uh, you're good at answering the questions that keep me up at night. <laughs> um, I mean, I'm, I'm not a psychiatrist or clinically trained, so, you know, far be it for me to suggest this. But uh, nonetheless, I will I will say, I think despite the, I think, optimism that surrounded the introduction of this classification system that, you know, at first was really focused on the U.S., but then kind of grew to English speaking countries. And as I understand now, has grown to really a lot of a lot of different jurisdictions use the DSM to govern their sort of understanding of mental health. So it's become really, really important, despite the fact that I think every place also has a number of critics, you know, that it is, it is important. Um, it's the best we've got is sort of the language we hear, but also it is open to lots of criticism. It, it aligns with different, um, I mean, different insurance systems, for example, you know, if you're in the DSM, your insurance will pay this if you're in a system that relies on that kind of insurance, like the U.S. is. Um, in Canada, we have a little bit of both. So um, we rely on it, but we also have publicly funded health care. It's also been really, uh, it's been challenged on a variety of um, human rights levels as well. So activists who push against the pathologization of certain kinds of symptoms that, you know, might be actually not that distressing or not that, you know, we can live with these sorts of things. So the neurodiversity movement, for example, that will push that like these should not be pathological categories. So there's so much tension that I think lots of different places has been critiqued. Despite, despite the um, claims of its efficacy, we have more and more and more mental distress and mental illness in our world than ever before. Um, higher rates of suicide, higher rates of addiction, higher rates of comorbid, you know, conditions that link together different psychiatric problems and other problems, whether that's housing insecurity, food insecurity, all sorts of problems. So I think there's a kind of cultural exhaustion with trying to measure it. And I think people are seeking maybe more radical think outside the box kinds of solutions. And I mean, we'll need some future historian to answer this question, I think, but it strikes me that, you know, we're in a kind of collective moment of despair, not just from the COVID pandemic, which contributes to that, but existential crisis related to global warming. I don't know about you guys, but my kids aren't allowed to play soccer right now because there's so much smoke in the air that it's not considered safe to be outside. When the environment becomes toxic, I think this causes a lot of concern and searching for meaning. And psychedelics are filling, I think, a cultural gap or a cultural kind of thirst for some kind of meaning that it seems to fit that space. And right now, there's a lot of capital, uh, sort of emotional and psychological capital, as well as financial capital, suggesting that psychedelics might be that, you know, panacea. I'm nervous about that. I don't think this is a magic bullet. But I do think that the concept of psychedelics, not just like, if I had mushrooms, my life would be better, but like investing in the idea 
that psychedelics have these different kinds of roots. They might make us think differently about our relationship to nature, that they, you know, get us out of our own heads sometimes. That idea, that ethos might actually be a cultural antidote to some of the existential angst that I think we're facing. That's a bit yeah. so easy, but... <laughs> no, thank you. I really appreciate the answer. And maybe I could continue on that uh, mm. with another question, because I think psychedelics offer another way of thinking about problems instead of like isolating like depression from alcoholism, they seem to like uh, lead one to a more mm, complex view of like what, what actually is mental suffering and the healing from that. And I think there's a way of thinking about psych psychiatric medicine, uh, like efficacy under the uh, like RTC model, the action of the drug is separated from all contextual factors. factors. And the second approach is healing the patient with like all the tools we have and including all the positive contextual factors that could have an effect. And it seems that psychedelics are useful uh, when con these contextual features are valued. And I'm thinking that could the re-emergence re of psychedelic therapy change how we see the value of these contextual factors in the healing from mental illness? Yeah, it's a really good question. I, I think it's going to be interesting. I'm, I'm, looking forward to this meeting in uh, Colorado, where I know this is one of the questions that there's a panel coming together on this. I don't know if we'll come up with any answers there, but it is interesting because you see this kind of tension existing between how to measure efficacy or kind of questioning what you're measuring. You know, are you measuring a pharmacological effect or are you measuring an experience, um, you know, a, a more holistic experience, you know, like maybe the LSD is just one part of the experience of, you know, breathing through this experience, this moment, you know, listening to music, meditating, all of the other things that come with it, you know, maybe you can't actually like identify the causal effect here, but it's a package. And that aligns much more closely with the way that indigenous ceremonial uses have um, been talked about, how indigenous users talk about it um, historically, that it's not the psychedelic. That's like as important as the couch or the lighting or all of these ingredients um, sort of come together to form a package. And that's what gives meaning, um, not the chemical causal effect either. That would require a different way, a very different way, I think, of imagining mental health systems, mental health treatments, mental health research, categorizations, everything. It, it's pretty massive. And I think that's overwhelming. I think it's hard to say like, what we need is just like smash it all down and everybody takes some mushrooms in the forest and we'll feel better. You know, I, that's, that's the kind of Timothy Leary approach, like just put it in the water supplies. I don't think that's the answer either, but I do think that as you start sort of going, pulling on that thread, it begins to unravel the entire tapestry that, you know, you can't just fix this dose or, you know, get the right playlist. There are people trying. But I think it opens up these broader questions. I mean, I'll make a plug here too. I think I think that this is a, a set of questions that cannot be answered by a single discipline. I'm not convinced that, you know, not, neither historians nor psych psychiatrists nor philosophers like have the kind of tools that are necessary. I think it really requires a kind of broad-based in, investment from a variety of different ways of thinking and organizing our sense of knowledge um, because it does tap into so many different elements of the human experience. Um, I'm not really answering your question, I don't think. <laughs> I think you are. And I think okay. like just having an appreciation for the complexity we're dealing with here is like a very good starting point. And yeah. It's another... not been our mantra for a long time to, you know, embrace complexity. It's more like keep things still, you know, stabilize all of these different things so you can measure this particular reaction. That kind of reductionist approach has really been overwhelming in Western medicine for, you know, a, a while now, like, you know, 150 years or so. Um, so to unpack that and go in the other direction is both radical, um, but it could be quite destabilizing as well. There are now a few questions on the chat I would like to take next. Two of them are anonymous at this time. Uh, there's a question that psilocybin containing mushrooms grow all over Finland and nearby countries but we don't seem to have indications that they were ever used for psychedelic or shamanistic purposes here. Any ideas why not and why they were in other places? It's, it's a great question that I don't have an answer to, um, but I, you know, 
I would love for you all to answer that sometime for me. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I wonder about, uh, there was a book written by Valentina Pavlova, Pavlovna Wasson. Uh, she did this study, gosh, I think it's 1956, but don't quote me on the on the date there. She died in 58, so it's before then. And she did a comprehensive study of mushrooms in, uh, in Russia. Um, and it was published in Russian. It hasn't been translated. And I don't read Russian. And I mean, I know that Finland is not Russia, but I don't know how her, so where her geographical borders are. Or And she was studying folkloric traditions. So it's like a the translation is something like a history of the mushroom and folkloric traditions. Um, her husband, Gordon Wasson, is the one who went to Mexico, uh, as she did too, and met Maria Sabina and introduced psilocybin mushrooms to the United States. So these are kind of a notorious couple. But she's an ethnomycologist initially, and then later a pediatrician who grew up in Moscow. So I think, you know, there's talk of having that book translated. Maybe some of you can read Russian. Maybe there are adjacent Finnish studies. I don't know if she even sort of covers, you know, maybe some Sami traditions. But part of what I understand from that earlier ethno-botanical approach was that part of this was about cataloging traditions and then seeing whether or not psychedelics fit second. So not starting with psychedelics, but going with the culture first. And embedded in that, there might be remnants or elements of you know what how were people using psilocybin mushrooms in and again I don't know if she covers Finland at all um but it I think it's like eastern folkloric traditions or something is the title so check the geography on it but if she can't be the only one I think also who's scouring this so there are linguists um and ethnobotanists in the Pacific Northwest who's who've also been tracking the uses of botanical material in indigenous contexts in, in the Pacific Northwest and Canada and the United States, also um, mushrooms grow to a point. Um, and then we see mushrooms continue to grow further up the coast, but the stories about them are silent. And I'm just not convinced that, and maybe this uh, anonymous attendee isn't either, that that means that nobody ever used them or there were no you know, uh, codified ways of using them that are just not transmitted into the kind of public discourse. Um, so I'd be really curious. And, and the language piece is so fascinating because when we go into Indigenous languages, not me, when others do it, um, there are, you can kind of tease out these stories of the ways in which people have been using things like mushrooms, but also a variety of different things, even brews that we might associate more with like a kind of ayahuasca tradition. Um, but these different concoctions that produce hallucinogenic effects that are used in transition ceremonies, are used in childbirth, are used in aging ceremonies, they're used to sort of seek wisdom in times of trouble. They're not called psychedelic but they do fit into these cultural traditions. And I, I would just, I just am, I don't know, maybe aggressive enough to say that I don't believe that it doesn't exist. It just may not be that it is recorded in a place that um, they could get in trouble for. <laughs> but if anybody finds that uh, Wasson, that Pavlovna Wasson book, you know, that that might be a, a clue. <laughs> Thank you. Then there was another anonymous question. Uh, to what extent do you see the phenomena that ended up being relevant in the ban of psychedelics in the 60s repeating now, uh, besides often uttered reasons like we should proceed with caution that people often repeat? So mm -hmm. what are the some of the not that often talked about main lessons from back then that you as a historian think we should be paying attention to right now? Well, my polite answer, I think, would be you know, that I think that some of the people using, uh, well, I'll just say that I went on a road trip to San Francisco two years ago. I drove from, I kind of followed Humphrey Osmond's trip to meet Hub, uh, Aldous Huxley. I didn't, it was during COVID. So I only went through certain states that had high vaccine rates and things like that. I didn't take the same route. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I was interviewing people who I think, thought had been sort of identified as part of the hippie movement. So Jerry Garcia's wife, or, you know, Terrence McKenna's ex-wife, I stayed with them, I learned from them, I worked with them on their libraries. And what was interesting was not only that, you know, these, 
I was mostly talking to women, A, they're still alive, and B, they like kept stuff and remember things. <laughs> so um, they were really valuable to me. I learned a lot from that experience, uh, partly in that they have a lot of deep knowledge about how people managed psychedelics while they were illegal. So how do you kind of manage that gray zone? How do you take care of kids? How do you really kind of invest in harm reduction before that concept is coined? Um, and in some respects, they're being written off now as, you know, part of the problem. Like we don't want to repeat that part of history. So don't talk to those old hippie ladies because they had bad ideas. When in fact, I think that's a misread. I think that the fact that they survived and even thrived in some cases, uh, they made a living. They raised their kids. They, you know, got through these. I think there's a lot of embedded wisdom there that maybe again to soften those divisions and think about, you know, so what does that look like today? So I would hang out with these amazing women during the day and look at their photo albums and listen to their stories. And then, you know, I would find a place to eat wherever, you know, usually at a pub in Oregon or whatever. And I'm sitting there talking with my friend who was traveling with me. And we're like, wow, that was so cool. Did you see Jerry Garcia's guitar? And we'd be talking. And undoubtedly, our I'm going to make an assumption here, our 20 year old something server would say, oh, yeah, I microdose. And you know, this is a cool thing. Already, I think it's happening. There are these generational differences between these 70 and 80 year old women with this sort of embodied wisdom. And these younger generation of people who are not being considered, you know, like, don't talk to them, these microdosing people like, might be doing something bad. But they are also developing their own tools and strategies for learning about how to take in this case, a lot of it was talking about microdosing, maybe that's a West Coast thing, but I don't think so. I think there are untapped bodies of knowledge here. And maybe we need to like, read some of the things that get posted on social media or even Reddit. And I don't mean believe at all, but these have become different forms of communicating that knowledge that typically aren't considered part of our kind of academic repository. It's not one of the places we take information from or consider it credible. And, and you know, I'm not suggesting we stop reading peer-reviewed materials, but there are these other places where these discussions are happening and people are figuring things out and working out what they consider to be safe. And it may begin to rival what policymakers are saying, you know, especially if people continue to take this stuff, whether or not it's illegal, maybe we need to sort of pay attention to some of those places where that conversation, those conversations are taking place. That's kind of an answer to, I think there's a lesson here for, you know, ignoring certain perspectives because we don't like them or think they're valid. Um, and my less polite answer is uh I, I have to say, uh, and maybe I'm going to get in trouble for saying this, um, I'm a little bit worried about some of the kind of celebrity status that is being associated with a kind of voice of psychedelics. And there are certain players, and you know, I don't think that anybody is behaving badly. Well, okay, people are behaving badly sometimes, but like, you know, assuming a kind of embodied wisdom or championing a particular perspective, I think is a little bit dangerous that we need a diversity of voices. We need to hear about how psychedelics, you know, how psilocybin mushrooms in Finland, why aren't they part of the conversation? Um, or what's going on in the trance music scene now? Um, how are people dealing with that? I think collapsing this all to a few major players, many of whom are, are, a position in the United States, not all, but um, sort of there are certain familiar voices on the stage. And I think we need to kind of open that up and think about a diversity of perspectives. Otherwise, there's a risk of collapsing everything into the sort of um, into one person or, you know, a select group of people who carry this story forward. And there's a real I think that's quite fragile. I think that that's not sustainable. Thank you for your answer. I think those are really important points. Thanks. Um, next, we have actually Henry asking another other question. I think Henry would like to ask his question himself. Yeah, thanks for the fascinating lecture. Uh, so, yeah, what are some yet neglected areas of psychedelic history? And if you had infinite research funds, what would you like to do research on? Uh, that's that's a really hard question. Um, 
I started working with some colleagues doing this sort of global history. And I, you know, and this is, I promise, not just because I'm talking to you all who are, you know, multilingually talented and I'm mono, mono language here. But I think that, you know, reaching out beyond the sort of North American narrative or the English language narrative, there's so much more within the study of psychedelics. And I mean, I think it can be nourished by the history, but I think that it just expresses itself. We know that psychedelics defy language, they defy, you know, experiences become really difficult to describe. Um, I'd love to like work with a dynamic team of excited people who want to like dive into different ways that psychedelics, again, I'll use that as like a blank concept, but this generic concept rather, um, but different ways that they have sort of manifested in cultural and medicinal and spiritual language that gets at different ways of thinking about human consciousness or healing or existence. Um, that's one one uh, project that I would love to do, well, or be part of, I should say, I couldn't do it, but but be part of it. I think it would take, you know, you'd really have to have a team um, to, do, to do it justice. Um, and I forget what the first part of your question was. <laughs> Sorry, I got excited about infinite funds. <laughs> was about neglected areas of psychedelic history. Uh, yeah. I mean, I think that there's still a lot more that can be done with Indigenous uses of psychedelics um, or or just non-Western uses of psychedelics more broadly. It's tricky. I, I've worked with some groups in Canada and, you know, I think there's a long embedded and complicated history of taking information from certain groups and then using it to sort of commodify or capitalize on that information that doesn't necessarily benefit the group that shared it. I mean, there are examples of this that, you know, certainly the story of Maria Sabina, who, you know, welcomed these Americans into her home and introduced them to psilocybin mushrooms. And then this kind of launched a, a psychedelic tourism where people were coming there and, you know, really excited to like take a vow of poverty in an impoverished region that was transformed and in some respects sort of, um, you know, gutted as tourists came and took psilocybin mushrooms, but didn't really help to stimulate the local economy. There was no reciprocal relationship there. So I, I think it's an important area of study and one that I think we need to proceed with caution. I think just like going and finding Indigenous uses of whatever, maybe it's mushrooms or peyote or, or, or ayahuasca, whatever it might be, San Pedro, um, isn't the same as really sort of, I don't know, there has to be a, an honor. There has to be some honor in how we proceed with that. You know, uncovering these stories may not necessarily benefit the people who have kept these stories safe for many, many years. Um, and so I think we need to proceed with caution and how we move forward with that, despite the fact that I think there's a desire to know what's happening in Amazon regions and in the, you know, Sacred Valley of Peru, there's a lot of attention to some of these areas, but I don't think the people who have coveted this wisdom are benefiting necessarily the same as, you know, I don't know, Michael Pohl, and I'll pick on him because he sold millions of books. <laughs> uh, I'm sure he's a nice guy. I don't mean to pick on him, but, you know, there just seems to be an imbalance in who benefits from uh, psychedelic knowledge these days. And I think there's a real risk in capitalizing without it's not very psychedelic to capitalize on this knowledge <laughs> thank you there's still two questions in the q a and i think we might have time for like uh two more questions or so in addition to those so i, I want to encourage uh participants to uh, ask any questions that are still left uh unsaid and the next question in the q a is that isn't the dichotomy between Western vs. indigenous use partially created by the modern conceptualization of psychedelics, meaning that if approaches in theogens, as they have uh, a major part of their history, isn't their integration to col current culture through rit ritualistic and religious containers, wouldn't this be like a natural option? Yeah, this is a good intervention. I think the term entheogen is coined, I think it's 1979. Um, don't quote me, I'm sure Wikipedia has the, the answer there, but uh, it's, it's a little bit later. It's in the 1970s, and it comes from a team of ethnobotanists largely. And I think Albert Hoffman was part of that group that pushed this term forward as well. Um, all this to say that I think it is 
a really interesting concept that sort of gets at some of those other elements that may be a balancing or reciprocal relationship, arguably, about thinking about plants as teachers. And it really prioritizes those plants over the chemicals um, or the synthetics, if you will. It, it's interesting to see that it hasn't um, necessarily taken up the same momentum. It seems to sort of cleave off. Psychedelics continues to sort of dominate the language right now, uh, for better or worse. Um, I, I do think that there's an opportunity there to sort of invest in that concept or that idea to think more deeply about these reciprocal relationships. And I don't know what it's like in, in Finland on this topic, but right now, um, certainly in Canada and perhaps to a lesser extent in the United States, the concept of uh, Indigenous reciprocity and reconciliation is very much front and center of all of our sort of political mandates. Um, our school systems are going through a reconciliation process. There's been a national inquiry. And so it may be partly that, you know, I'm coming from that context where the concept of Indigenous reciprocity is something that we all have to acknowledge in every grant application. You know, how will this benefit Indigenous people of Canada? And in some ways, I think that's really good. It's good to force the issue. And in some ways, there are, you know, opportunities to sort of uh, have a bit of a superficial response rather than diving into the complexity. And so I think reinvesting in entheogens as a concept would help to sort of pull out some of that complexity and maybe help to rethink rather than just saying, you know, checking a box, so to speak, as sometimes happens in grant applications. I think it'd be good to do a deep dive into thinking about who actually benefits from some of the investment in this knowledge production um, and whether that's commodified as a healing remedy or not. I don't know. I think it would like, it would come back to your question, Ansi, about like uh, rethinking our mental health system. If it were to be indigenized or to think differently, it would necessarily bring in different dimensions of, you know, spiritual distress that I think are more front and center than um, emotional and psychological distress that sometimes I think is more comfortable language within a kind of Western framework. So whether mushrooms would cure that or not, I'm not sure, but investing in that concept, I think would help to open up those conversations. Thank you. I think that's a really good answer. <laughs> then the last question in the Q and A is that, are there findings that have really surprised you during your deep dive into psychedelic history? Um, yes, all the time. I mean, well, finding that letter with the word psychedelic on it uh, as a PhD student in the archives, I think I think I like shrieked at that moment. <laughs> that was pretty exciting. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I think doing this kind of research is often very humbling. Um, you know, I had certain ideas about what I thought, you know, different players represented. And I don't know, I spent uh, a week in the Timothy Leary archives. And I was like, you know, he's not maybe quite the monster I I first thought he was. Um, like reading through these reams and reams of correspondence of him trying to sort of find his way in this world too. There, it's, it's, um, I don't know. I, it's easy to empathize with subjects when you're actually face when you face them, and it's a, a humbling reminder. Meeting these many people who identify, I think, as as hippies or wise women of the past. I don't know. They had different language that they used to describe themselves. It was also a really humbling experience and super fun. I should say it was really fun. But um, just learning about different techniques that people had used. You know, the story is not one of recklessness and, you know, trying to cultivate a revolution even. Um, there was a lot more complexity in why people were taking psychedelics, even at a Grateful Dead concert. Um, I, something that surprised me that I'll share is that they had a backstage daycare at the uh, early Grateful Dead concerts. Maybe they still do. I don't know. Maybe, but uh, I think it's more old age care now. Uh, um, I'm not even joking. Um, but thinking about the place of kids at these major concerts was also something that surprised me. And I was like, I just had never thought about that. I never thought that, of course, these guys, the guys performing, have lots of kids and that they were taking care of each other. And they're now in their 50s and have really active memories of what it was like growing up in this environment. Um, and so, I, I don't know, It's I find this kind of research is always just very humbling. There's surprises every step of the way. That makes me curious and excited to do more. <laughs> Thank you. Then there's a question about uh, your take on the Eleusinian mysteries. 
Was ancient Greek or Roman philosophy influenced by psychedelics and to what extent? And could this have a connection with the platonic values of seeking the true, the good and the beautiful? It's a great question that I'm not even going to touch. Um, I don't know. I, I know that this is a, a deep debate and I, I have a couple of books that I could recommend that take different perspectives on this. Um, but the answer is I, I really don't know. I think I think there's a real desire and a temptation to align psychedelics with all of these, you know, kind of rich moments that help to sometimes I think sanitize them or give them a kind of cultural currency. And so, I mean, I hope to kind of stimulate that thought a little bit with the beginning of the lecture, which, you know, you we can try to align psychedelics with different kind of roots and origin points that I think help to sometimes stabilize them or align with certain values that we have today. And it's really, it's really exciting and tempting. And I think what we see with the Eleusinian mysteries and where historians have made that connection is another attempt. Like I don't know if they're actually related. I'm not sure if the evidence is strong enough. Um, but I think the desire to make that connection is another sort of symbol of proof of it. An attempt to sort of demonstrate that like psychedelics have been here for a long time. This is not something that the Beatles, you know, invented, or I, I know that's ridiculous, but you know, it's not something that is flimsy or ephemeral. This is something that is a deep part of our human history and deserves bona fide attention. And uh, so to that, I, I kind of applaud the desire to make these connections, um, though I don't know enough about the evidence to say, like, I think it's true or not. <laughs> Maybe it doesn't matter. Uh, one question appeared to the Q&A, and mm -hmm. after that, I would like to ask my own final question. But sure. what's, the, what's the toughest psychedelic question you still <laughs> find meaningful to engage with? Well, if I can take out the meaningful part and offer a joke first, um, at my PhD defense, which was in 2005, so just kind of imagine the conversation about psychedelics in 2005, I was asked if I'd ever taken psychedelics, and uh, I did not like having to answer that to a room of examiners, um, you know, determining whether or not I would get my degree. Um, so I found that to be a really difficult question, but I found that that question um, I got asked that question a lot at the beginning of my studies, and recently that question has transitioned from, have you ever taken psychedelics? Oh, by the way, my answer, which because I was obviously very nervous, was I didn't inhale, um, which seemed to satisfy the examiners, which made me very terrified that they had not read my thesis. <laughs> because Anyway, um, but now it's, what's your favorite psychedelic? And, you know, so the conversation about, you know, experience and whether or not it's okay to have tried psychedelics in order to study this, or whether it's assumed that you've taken psychedelics to study this, that's a question that I find really is so interesting the way that it's been asked over time. That's my dodge. Um, toughest question, though? I don't know. I, I mean, I think sort of on a, on a policy side of thing, things, I really think that it's really hard to think of a framework for managing psychedelics like if you were if you had unlimited funds and you know the control of the policymaker you know role how would you regulate them i think that's a really really hard question um and i i really don't know the answer and i have been sort of plugging away at this and looking at different historical precedents and looking at different precedents in different jurisdictions you know do you do you go the way of the state of oregon and just say psychedelics that grow they're just legal. Um, and if that, then what? Uh, I I get really nervous about, you know, there's, it's exciting to be kind of libertarian sometimes about psychedelics and think, well, they should just be available like everything. They're like, but okay, but then should we invest in like more bike lanes? Um, you know, do we need to think about traffic control? What do we, I, I mean that as a, partly a joke, but what do we do with kids who find mushrooms in the school pay, playground? Like, how do we talk about managing psychedelics in a realistic, meaningful way. You know, not these kind of blunt instruments that cleave them into like good or bad or prohibited or not. Um, but, you know, if psychedelic enthusiasts actually got our heads together and thought, okay, yes, but there are some limitations to how psychedelics should be opened up, you know, um, and, and what would that actually look like? But it seems right now that so much of the energy and focus is on like 
pushing them into the kind of white space, if we go with the market idea of the black, gray, and white market, that I'm not sure we've really wrestled with the consequences of what happens when psychedelics or what happens if psychedelics um, become sort of legalized or open or accessible, um, who will take responsibility for the things that happen that we don't want. And that's going to happen. I mean, it happens with aspirin. It happens with all sorts of regulated substances. So I feel like it's part of the conversation that hasn't fully happened, or at least not openly. Maybe it's happening behind closed doors, but that's tough. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, as a last question, which we might have like three minutes, which is a very short time for a question like this, but I would still like to present it. Uh, you have probably met like really interesting figures while doing your research about the history of psychedelics. Is there a story you would like to tell us or like a, a voice that you uh, think is important to these discussions that you uh, for a short while would like to in somehow amplify or share with us? Hmm. So many. Um, all right, I'm going to pick one. I don't know if it's like the best one, but it's one that comes to mind right now. Um, there's a woman named Eileen Garrett who, you know, I'm finding I, I I discovered her at one point and, you know, I keep seeing her name popping up and I think I want to do some more sustained research on her. Eileen Garrett was considered uh, a psychic. Um, she's part of the parapsychology network. And you might think, what does that have to do with psychedelics? But I'm finding a variety of people like Humphrey Osmond, like Aldous Huxley, uh, a variety of psychedelic researchers who were reaching out in these sort of paranormal circles. This And so this one woman who becomes like a very sort of famous, almost mainstream psychic, she's like hired by the, um, the CIA or the FBI at some point in the United States. She's actually uh, based in France. Um, but she becomes a kind of respectable figure within these circles. And yet you know, conversations about like, oh, yeah, I met with my friend, the psychic, you know, these aren't things that make their way into scientific publications. As again, we're like those maps show something really cool, but they also show limitations to what is allowed to be talked about or recognized in the moment. And yet she's on the board of psychedelic research units. And so there is a clearly another set of conversations that's taking place here, sometimes in living rooms and sometimes at her French villa, apparently, um, about thinking about human consciousness that also was considered not okay to talk about in, you know, mainstream scientific publications. So she's just, again, an example of a conversation that probably involves a whole lot of other people as well, but it's just kind of been percolating in my mind as like, there's another domain of marginalized offside offbeat research or conversations that could could be part of this. And I think it's probably a bit scary. Like, you know, I think people don't want to introduce that aspect because like that could ruin our RCTs or that will ruin what the FDA thinks we're doing. Um, and yet, you know, like I said, I think we need a diversity of voices at the table. Um, maybe even those that are channeled through like past lives or something. I'm, I'm kidding, but um, maybe not. Uh, I just think that those perspectives, it was clear that she was really an honored member of some of these conversations and that sort of disappeared from some of this conversation there's one <laughs> yes thank you for sharing <laughs> and we're very at our end of our time here and i really want to uh thank you for uh speaking with us and being our guest today and it was a really uh, great opportunity to talk to you and if there are any closing words you would like to say before uh, I will say mine, we could have a, like a minute or so left for if, if there's anything. I just wanted to say thank you for having me and for this opportunity to, to virtually meet many of you. And uh, thanks so much. Thank you. So as my own closing words, I will say a few words about our association. So if you're not a member of Tutu, we invite you to consider becoming one and you can buy a support membership in our web store at holvi.com slash shop slash tutu. And if you're working or studying in an academic discipline relevant to psychedelic research and currently uh, carry out or are planning to carry out psychedelic research 
or wish to actively advance such research, you may apply for a full membership. And you'll find more info and the application form at sutu.fi slash n slash participate slash membership. And we also accept donations. More info at sutu.fi slash lahjoita. And please follow us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter to keep updated about our future events and other activities. And thank you very much for everyone who came here today. And have a good night or a good day, depending on uh, which time zone you are living in.